There's a powerful scene in the Passion of the Christ movie when Jesus is carrying the cross to Calvary. He has been whipped and he has been flogged. His face is bloody. He's wearing the crown of thorns and he's carrying the heavy cross up to Calvary. And on the journey there, he stumbles and he falls over. And in the scene, his mother Mary rushes to her son's side. And as she is trying to look at him in the face with blood dripping down his face, he looks into the eyes of his mother and he says, See, mother, I make all things new. And then, with a determined look on his face, he rises to his feet, picks up the cross, and marches on to Calvary. See, mother, I make all things new. Of course, this is a powerful reference to a couple of selected passages of Scripture, passages like Isaiah 43, which says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. It is also a reference to Revelation 21, when Jesus says, And the one who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. We all long to live in a world which is new. We all long to live in a world which is free of suffering, heartache and pain. But when we look at the world around us, we realise that the world around us is anything but new. The world around us is anything but free of pain and suffering. A few months ago, the death toll from COVID passed the 6 million mark. This past week alone, 3,000 people in Australia were diagnosed with cancer and over 900 people lost their battle. With increased missile attacks in Ukraine, the death toll, depending on which figures you read, now stands anywhere between 10 and 50,000 people. The floods which have hit this nation constantly in the past year alone have done in excess of $5 billion worth of damage. More than 80 million people in Eastern Africa are now at risk of starvation due to the incredible food shortages. And this is just a drop in the ocean. This is just a grain of sand because there is suffering which people in our community, people in our church, our neighbours, our family and friends are suffering on a daily basis. Financial pain, relationship suffering, the loss of loved ones, depression, anxiety, stress. Try seeing a mental health professional and waiting times are from two months to even above six months. The world is anything but new. The world experiences the same old problem of suffering. And today, as we continue our mental health series in the book of Psalms, moving forward with mental well-being, we're focusing on Psalm 22 and on this very old problem of suffering. And once again, Psalm 22 is attributed to the courts of David, King David, Israel's great Old Testament king. And once more, we do not know the specific situation that is gripped David. We don't know the specific situation or the specific set of circumstances which are causing King David to suffer. But he begins Psalm 22 with these very chilling words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. King David talks about his suffering through the lens of the people around him who are mocking him and insulting him. He says, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people, all 
who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. David describes his suffering through the metaphor of being attacked by wild animals. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Basan, a region in modern-day Syria, encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all of my bones are out of joint. We all long to live in a new world, in a world which is free from suffering and pain. The age-old question of suffering has been the greatest faith-breaker throughout the centuries. It doesn't matter what culture you are from. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. This problem is the age-old problem faced by people from all nations. The Greek philosopher Epicurus framed the problem like this. He said, if God is willing to prevent evil, but not able, then he is not all-powerful. If he is able to prevent evil, but not willing, then he is not all good. It doesn't matter what national background you come from. It doesn't matter what your past story is. Every single one of us, without fail, will face suffering in life. And our temptation when we face suffering and pain in our life is to ask the age-old question, if God is all good, if God is all loving, if God loves me personally, if God wants a personal relationship with me, why does he not end the suffering in this world? Why does he not prevent suffering? Suffering comes in all shapes and sizes, in all forms. There's the personal suffering that each and every one of us experience. Sometimes it is the result of the way other people have treated us. We have done nothing wrong, but other people treat us poorly, or other people hurt us, they abuse us, and therefore we suffer. Sometimes we suffer as a result of our poor decisions and our poor choices in life. But then sometimes there is natural suffering. When nobody's at fault, there are earthquakes, there are floods, there are natural disasters, there are pandemics. There's pain and suffering, there is cancer, there is heart disease, there is natural suffering. So we say to God, God, if you have my best interest at heart, if you love me, why? My God, why are you not preventing my suffering? And then because we feel that there is not an adequate answer, many of us are tempted to abandon and reject God. If you go on YouTube, you will see YouTube is littered with accounts of regular people, with celebrities, with general members of the public who are sharing their testimonies and stories about how they stopped believing in God because they couldn't reconcile the existence of an all-powerful, all-loving God with the presence of suffering and injustice in this world. So how do we, this morning as we talk about God over suffering, how do we address this age-old question that has caused many people in their faith in God to stumble? How do we answer this question? You know, do I give you an intellectual, logical answer to the problem of suffering? Maybe that will reach your mind, but will it reach your heart? Maybe I can give you an emotive answer that reaches your heart, but will it reach your brain? So how 
if we're going to talk about God over suffering, how do we address the problem of suffering? How do we address David's cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why, God, do children die innocently, my God? Why, God, do relationships and divorce run havoc in our society? Why, God, are there natural disasters? Why, God, did I lose my child? Why, God, did you not heal my grandmother of her cancer? Why, God, is there suffering? How do we address this age-old question? Do I encourage you with the answer that it is okay because God is with you in your suffering? Do I talk about how suffering is just a product of the fallen world that we live in and one day God is going to put it right again and suffering is only limited to the time and space of our earthly reality and once we're in heaven rejoicing with God, there will be no more suffering. Do I talk about suffering and put it in a positive light and say that suffering and pain can make you stronger? Just like a weightlifter will lift weights and tear their muscles, over time they become stronger. Do I reassure you and say that don't worry because the Bible promises us that in the midst of our suffering, God is with us. Do I talk about the fact that God can use our suffering for good? That God can use our suffering so that we can be a comfort to others? Or do I even talk about the fact that God has the ability in the midst of our suffering to give us a peace which transcends all knowledge and understanding? Or do I talk and give an intellectual defence to philosophers about suffering and how it is compatible with the existence of a loving God. Or perhaps I approach this question about suffering from a very different perspective. Perhaps in this message we do something different. Perhaps in this message I answer the age-old question about suffering and the loving good nature of God. Maybe I answer this question in a different way. Yes, that is it. I answer the question of suffering the way Jesus answered the question of suffering. The way Jesus answered this question about suffering when they called out to him at the cross and they said, if you truly are God, if you truly were the one who could save others, save yourself. I will answer this question the way Jesus answered the question. And the way Jesus answered the question about the age-old problem of suffering was to give the world the greatest answer it could ever understand. It was to give the world an answer which hit both their hearts and their minds. It was the answer which gives hope to people in the midst of suffering. It's an answer that gives hope to people of all nations. It is the greatest possible answer. It shows us how suffering is compatible with the love and goodness of God. It is the answer Jesus himself gave after the cross, three days later, when he rose from the grave. For the answer to the question of suffering, which men and women have been asking for centuries, is this. It is the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is the answer to why there is suffering in the world. The resurrection of Jesus is the answer to how the loving nature of God can look upon terrible atrocities, abuse, and still be good and still be loving. It is the answer to how Jesus one day will end all forms of suffering, personal, environmental suffering, all forms of suffering. The day he set in motion his plan to make all things new, the day Jesus 
walked out of the grave. And I want to encourage you this morning with just one key takeaway, just one key message of application, so that when you go into this world, when you sit at night lamenting before God in the midst of your suffering, or when those around you doubt the existence of God in the midst of their suffering, I want you to answer them with the same answer Jesus gave, and that was the resurrection is the answer to all human suffering. The empty tomb is the answer to the problem of suffering. And I just want to give you one key message of application today to help you frame your personal suffering within the lens of the goodness, the love, and the stability that God alone can offer you. And it is to tell you this, when we suffer, when we suffer, we become attached to the very suffering Christ experienced at the cross. When we suffer, we become attached to the very suffering of Jesus himself at the cross. And if we in our suffering become attached to Jesus in his suffering at the cross, we too, like Jesus, will walk out of the grave in victory. That is what suffering is about. It is about the fallen world, sinful men and women who become attached to the very suffering of Jesus at the cross. The New Testament has many verses which emphasize this point. Jesus himself said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Paul, the great persecutor of the church who turned into the great evangelist, went through many periods of suffering for the gospel. And on multiple occasions, he said things like this, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. In Corinthians, he says, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. In Philippians, he says, I want you to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. And listen to this point and underline it in your Bibles and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. You see, the promise of the New Testament is this, is that we cannot understand the glory which awaits us in eternal life, the powerful resurrection which awaits us, unless we too participate in the sufferings of Jesus. Peter, one of the great disciples of Jesus, one of the first on the scene who witnessed the entirety of Jesus' ministry, said this, For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, it is commendable before God. To this you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Peter also said, But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in Christ's sufferings, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Friends, the point of all of these passages is this. When we participate 
in the sufferings of this earth, we become attached to the very suffering that Jesus experienced at the cross. And if we attach ourselves to the suffering that Jesus experienced at the cross, what happens? We rejoice when the glory, when the resurrected body is made ours in eternal life. The only way to overcome suffering in this life is to attach yourself to Christ so that you and I may be victorious in the life that is to come. And this is the heart, this is the heartbeat of Psalm 22. Because as we read Psalm 22, we realise that Psalm 22 is not primarily about David. It is not primarily about David and his suffering. Because as you read Psalm 23, we realise that many of the things that David is talking about in Psalm 22 don't actually literally apply to David. David is speaking metaphorically about how he feels, but many of the things don't literally apply to David's life. For instance, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 15 specifically says that God would never abandon David. What about when David says that I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people, all who see me mock me? Well, David was never mocked by the people. The majority, the overwhelming majority of his fellow Israelites loved David. They welcomed David. They received him as his king. He wasn't despised by the people. What about when David says that I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint? My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. This never happened to David. David never experienced this sort of rejection. His bones were never out of joint. He was never laid by God in the dust of death. No, the Bible says that when David went to rest, he went to rest in the peace of his ancestors. David says, dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and feet. They pierce my hands and feet. This never happened to David. David never experienced this. It says that they divide up my clothes and cast lots. David never had his garments divided. So what is all of this about? Well, Psalm 22 is not primarily about David's suffering. Psalm 22 is about the suffering of the Messiah who was to come. Psalm 22 was about the suffering of Jesus at the cross for all of the things that David metaphorically speaks about in this passage, they happen to Jesus at the cross when he is crucified. The Bible says about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had forsaken Jesus in that moment because the holy, righteous presence of God could not stand in the place of sin which Jesus had become in order to save us. The Gospels talk about those who passed by, hurled insults at him, shaking their hands and saying, you are going to destroy the temple. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Well, Jesus was the one who was assigned the grave with the wicked, is what Isaiah tells us. 
The Bible talks about at the crucifixion of Jesus, they divided his clothing, they stripped him down and divided his clothing. All the things that David speaks about are true of Jesus, the Messiah. So what is Psalm 22 about? It is not about the suffering of David. It is about the suffering of God. For when David says that they pierce my hands and feet, and the Hebrew is not easily translatable in this passage, but it refers to the idea of wild animals with sharp teeth like lions, boring literally at the hands and feet of somebody, the way that Jesus' hands were pierced and bored with the nails at the cross. You see, my friends, suffering, when we suffer, we attach ourselves to the suffering of Jesus at the cross. And what Psalm 22 is an encouragement about is this, is that yes, David suffered. Yes, you and I suffer. But above our suffering is the suffering of Jesus at the cross. That is the lens by which we look at suffering. Have you ever seen in TV shows those police mirrors, you know, when in one room they're interviewing the bad guy or the suspect and in another room, the police are looking into that room through a two-way mirror where the person being interviewed cannot see out the other way. Our suffering is like that. When we are in one room, when we are being interviewed in the middle of our suffering, we see only our suffering in the mirror. But when we change rooms and we look through the other side, we see the suffering of Jesus at the cross, which sits above our suffering. And that's why Romans gives us this powerful promise that we ought to consider our present sufferings not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. When we look at our suffering through the lens of Jesus' suffering at the cross, we see the glory which awaits us. But I want to close just with this powerful story. I read the book called Night by Eliezer Wiesel. Eliezer Wiesel was a Jew who grew up during the Second World War. He grew up in Transylvania, which was part of Romania and became part of Hungary at one point. But he grew up as a faithful Jewish boy who loved to pray, who loved to study the Bible, who loved to study the centuries-old traditions that the Jewish rabbis had passed down. And one day, as a young boy who had not even reached adulthood yet, he and his family were taken on trains by the Nazis, to the concentration camp Auschwitz. Auschwitz, which was more than just a concentration camp, it was a factory of death where thousands, tens upon tens upon tens of thousands were gassed and forced into labour. And he talks about in this book, Night, how the men and women were separated and he was separated from his mother and his younger sister, whom he never saw again. And he was separated from his other two sisters who he would later be reunited with in an orphanage. And he stayed with his father as they were sent to their allotment in the camp. And in this book, Night, he talks about his struggles and his pain as he saw the atrocities being committed by his people. He talked about how his faith in the almighty God wavered and how he had abandoned hope. He talked about how those around him tried to keep their hope and their faith in God, how they still tried to keep the festivals. They still would sometimes pray and they would still fast. And he spoke about how in the midst of this unbelievable, unimaginable, inhumane treatment, the atrocities, he talked about how his faith would slip away and how he could just not bless the name of the Lord any longer. And one day, 
he shared a story which broke him. It was the story about two men and a young boy who were hanged by the German soldiers. The Germans had suspected that perhaps some of the Jews in the camp were sabotaging some of their operations when they were sent to labour factories. They suspected that perhaps they were planning an uprising in the camp. So they tortured those who they believe had information and they took these two men and this young boy and hanged them and made all the prisoners in the camp watch as this took place. And the two men died instantly. But Eliezer speaks about how the boy, because he was too small, did not die instantly, but instead slowly choked to death. And as people were witnessing this, one man behind him cried out, Where is God? Where is God? And as each of the men walked past the three boy as he clung between life and death, Eliezer walked past him and saw that he was still alive, but his time was slowly coming to an end. And those words that the man had called out echoed in his mind, Where is God? As you and I do the same in the midst of our suffering, those words echo to us, Where is God in the midst of our suffering? And Eleazar, as he pondered that question, he said, a still voice spoke to him in that moment. A still voice spoke to him in that moment. Where is God, the voice said. He is up there, hanging at the gallows. Where is God in the midst of our suffering? He was hanging at the cross. He was hanging at the cross. And Psalm 22 ends with these powerful words which will echo through humanity forever. All the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. When Jesus cried out the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't just quoting the first few verses of Psalm 22. No, he was quoting the whole psalm. And Psalm 22 talks about the one who is suffering, the one to whom people hurl insults. No, this is the faithful one of God who despite their suffering stays faithful to God. That is what Psalm 22 was about. It was about rejoicing in the fact that the Messiah, despite his suffering, remained faithful to God through the midst of his suffering. And therefore, because he remained faithful to God, God would raise him up and dominion belongs to the Lord. And the words end with these powerful words. All the riches of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Future generations will be told about the Lord Future generations will be told about the Messiah at the cross. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. He has done it. At the cross and at the empty tomb, we answer the age-old question of suffering with the words, through the resurrection of Jesus, he has done it. He has brought an end to suffering for all time. 
He has made all things new. He has done it. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, thank you for joining us today. I hope you were encouraged by today's message. It's been so wonderful to be with you. We'd love to see you in service if you're able to join us. Uh, but otherwise, until then, we'll see you next week. God bless.